So far in mechanics of materials, we have learned about two building blocks, stress and strain. Also in the previous lecture, we talked about how these two building blocks are connected together. We talked about mechanical properties. We have learned how materials are behaving when they are subjected to forces, specifically in the tensile force. We draw a stress and strain curve in order to understand when they are failing and how they would behave before failure and after failure. What we want to do today is the very first engineering application of what we have learned. We as engineer design different load carrying structures. We want to understand what is the design process and how can we ensure that the structure that we are designing is capable to carry the force. But this is the basic course. Mechanics and materials is just laying the foundation for this concept. We are just learning the basic concepts of design. In fact, some of you may need to stay longer if you want to be expert in a certain area, go for grad studies in order to ensure that you have enough skills to do such designs. But today is very important because we want to learn the basic of design. Okay. As engineer in general, we are designing structures to carry the load in a safe way. In other words, we need to ensure that the structure that is subjected to force is safely carrying the load without failure, without breaking. Also, a structure that is carrying the force should be usable without excessive deformation or excessive vibration. These are the main criteria in our design. If you look at the strength criteria, we can simply define the strength criteria conceptually as the maximum stress that is happening within that structure should be smaller than the strength of the material that is used for making that structure. So this is the design equation conceptually. We use sigma for stress. Remember that sigma y was defined in stress strain curve. Sigma y was the stress after which the material is going to show excessive deformation. So with this criteria, we can say sigma, as long as sigma is smaller than sigma y, the structure is safe. But this design, this design approach has a major flaw. For that, I wanna do a quick experiment here. Can someone come over and help me in doing that experiment? Okay. So look at this from static point of view. There are two forces in this free body diagram. The weight pulls his body downward. And there is a force, reaction force, that comes from the table that equalizes that force, right? So from static point of view, he is in stationary situation. Now let's change the situation a little bit. Just imagine that you are here. <laughs> How do you feel? We know that from static point of view, it's the same. Same force, same gravity, everything is the same. What is the difference when you sit here versus the edge of that cliff? Okay, so you pointed out one thing that is very important, the risk of failure. So that difference in the consequence would make us feel different in these two cases. So as engineer, we need to be aware of the risks associated with our design. And based on the consequences, we do need to have a safety margin in our design. So I just wanted to give you an example about what is safety margin and how is that tied into the risk associated with our design. Assume that you are riding in man-made elevator, which consists of a car and a cable that is holding that car. He wants to know what would be the required diameter for the cable to be able to carry the load of this elevator. So the design equation says stress should be smaller than the yield stress. Sigma should be smaller than sigma y. Sigma is a force divided by area. How much is the force? 200 plus 210. So that would be 410 pounds is the total weight. Area of a cable would be pi over four diameter squared. Now I'm just gonna plug in the values here. Sigma is a force, which is 410 pounds divided by area. And that has to be smaller than yield stress, which is 36,000 PSI. And from that, if you solve it for diameter, that would be 0.12 inch. That would be something like this. Are you going to put your life to this tiny, small, wire and go a few hundred feet above the ground. Yes? Good. 
So next time, I'm going to ask you to do that experiment in the class. <laughs> Good. Again, these are examples showing that when we are going to design something, we need to be aware of those uncertainties. Like the load of the weight of the person, I said it's 210. What if that person ate a bit more food and he or she is weighing 211 pounds? Or the yield surface of the material is a bit smaller than what is assumed here. So in all those cases, this element is going to break if you are using that diameter. So we need to stay away from that boundary with a safety margin. From mechanics point of view, there are some uncertainties and risks associated with what we are designing. For instance, the loads that are assumed to be acting on structures are not exactly what we assume. In the same way, there are uncertainties in the materials. For instance, say this is steel bar. We tested this steel bar. This is going to break at 36,000 PSI. Does it mean if I take another steel bar, that is going to break exactly at the same value. There are some variation in the material, but we need to be aware of those variation and take them into consideration in our design using the safety margin. So instead of using sigma smaller than sigma y, in other words, instead of saying that the acceptable stress level is below sigma y, you are going to stay away from that boundary with a certain certain safety margin. And we can say that everything below the allowable stress is safe. So we are introducing a new concept called allowable stress. Any stress above that is not failing yet, but it is not safe anymore. In order to be safe, we want to stay below the allowable stress limit. Allowable stress is simply defined as yield stress divided by the factor of safety. This method that I just talked about is called the method of allowable stress. But this is not the only design method. There are some other advanced methods that take into consideration different factors for different risks. Those depends on different loading and the material. But again, here in this course, you want to understand and use the basic concepts. Factor of safety is a number larger than one. It shows how much we are standing away from that risk, how much we are standing away from the edge of that cliff. But we need to make sure that we are using the right value for the factor of safety. We are not going to choose the factor of safety typically. The right choice for the factor of safety is typically given by expert engineers. So say those who are going to design steel structures. There is a recommended value for the factor of safety. These are given by the building codes, the codes that determine how much safety you should need to provide for your structure. It depends on the risk. It depends on the uncertainties associated with structure. For instance, if you're working with the material that has more uncertainties, we know less about the material the factor of safety should be bigger. Sometimes we need to determine what is the current factor of safety within the structure. So I said that the factor of safety is not what we determine. It is given. But sometimes we have structure. We want to know how much is the factor of safety in this currently built structure. In that case, the factor of safety is defined as a ratio between the stress at failure over stress that currently exists in structure. When I say stress, it could be normal stress, shear stress, bearing stress, so any types of stress should be checked here, okay? And if structure has different values for the factor of safety, the lowest one is reported as the total factor of safety because that is where we see the highest risk for that structure, okay? So I wanted to review the concepts of design, and it would be best for us to look into some examples in order to make sure that we understand this. The figure shown is a typical beam column connection, which consists of an I-beam, which is connected by two gusset plates shown in gray to the column on the left side. There are six bolts that are connecting the beam to the gusset plate. So for this problem, we want to determine what is the maximum allowable axial force based on three different criteria. Part A, 
the normal stress in the gusset plate, part B, the maximum bearing stress in the gusset plate, and part C, the maximum shear stress in the bolts. So three different criteria. And part D is asking for how much is the maximum overall force that this connection can take. This is a very common practice in engineering. He wants to know how much is the maximum force a connection can take, and we need to ensure that the force acting on that connection is smaller than the maximum force that it could take. All right, let's look into that one by one. First of all, let's calculate the normal stress in the gusset plate. If you remember in module one, when we talked about normal stress, we noticed that normal stress in a plate that has a hole would be maximum where the holes are located. We call that section as a critical section, area would be minimum. So that area is called the net cross-section area. I'm gonna show that with A sub GN, G stands for gusset plate and N stands for net cross-section area. The total cross-section area of one plate would be equal to width of the plate multiplied by its thickness, W sub G multiplied by T sub G. And because there are two plates, I'm going to multiply that by two. But there are holes on that plate, and I need to subtract the area of the holes. The diameter of one hole is D. The height of the section, or the width of the gusset plate, is W sub G, and the thickness of each plate is T sub G. The area of one hole would be D multiplied by TG. So in total, we have three, which stands for the number of bolts in one vertical row, multiplied by two, because there are two plates on the sides, multiplied by diameter, multiplied by the thickness. So I subtracted the area of the hole out of that total cross-section area to calculate the net cross-section area. If you're rusty on this definition, I highly recommend you to watch the video that was previously given, where we discussed about the concept of bearing stress, normal stress, and how can we calculate them in these types of problems? After determining area, we can determine stress. Stress is force divided by area. This has to be smaller than the allowable stress. Allowable stress in the gusset plate is equal to the yield stress of the gusset plate divided by the factor of safety in the gusset plate. A sub G was calculated, other properties are given. So I'm gonna solve this for P after plugging in the values. The answer would be 478.3 kilonewton. For the second part, we want to talk about the bearing stress. Bearing stress is happening when two different elements are in touch with each other. In this case, the bolt and the gusset plate. If we look at one hole, one bolt, it is touching the plate in that hatched cross section area. So the contact area for the bearing stress shown by AB is equal to N, which is the number of bolts, multiplied by the diameter, multiplied by the thickness of the gusset plate, multiplied by two, which stands for the number of gusset plates in this case. The area would be 1344 squared millimeter. All right, now the bearing stress is a force divided by area, and that has to be smaller than the allowable stress in the gusset plate, which is the yield stress in the gusset plate divided by the factor of safety. Again, note that I'm using subscript G, which stands for the gusset plate. Now I'm gonna solve that for P, and the answer after plugging in the value would be 193.1 kilonewton. This is the maximum force that this connection can take before failing in bearing stress. Now let's talk about part C, which is shear stress in the bolts. The concept is the same. That force P has to be transferred by the bolts. We need to identify what is the cross-section area and then divide force over area and ensure that that stress is smaller than the allowable stress. So the question is, what is the area? How many bolts do we have for this problem? Six bolts are going to take that force. So area would be six bolts multiplied by the cross-section area of one circle. I need to make sure that I'm considering two sides of the gusset plate. So we have two multiplied by the number of bolts, multiplied by pi over four diameter squared. 
So for this case, we get the answer. And remember that n would be the number of volts, which is six in this case. And two is because this is a double shear connection. There are two gusset plates that are transferring the force to the bolts. Okay, shear stress in that case would be force divided by area. And that has to be smaller than the allowable stress for the bolts. Here, I'm going to use subscript B to highlight that we are working with the bolt. And then I'm gonna solve that for P and the answer for this problem would be equal to 236.4 kilonewton. All right, now let's answer this question. We have calculated three different values. The maximum force that the beam can take, the connection can take based on normal stress in the gusset plate was 478 kilonewton. The maximum force that this connection can take based on the bearing stress was 193 kilonewton. The maximum force based on shearing in the bolt is 236 kilonewton. What is the maximum allowable force that this connection can take before failure? Smallest one is going to be the weakest point. It's like a link that the weakest part is going to break first. So regardless of how strong the other components are, the weakest point is going to fail first, and that is ruining the entire design. So a good design is actually a design that these values are all close to each other. So we are maximizing the capacity on each side. It is not practically possible, but it is theoretically the best design. Okay, so the maximum allowable force in this case would be the minimum of these values, which is 193.1 kilonewton. Okay, enjoy the extended weekend. Come back fresh on Tuesday and I'll see you on Wednesday.